Welcome, everybody. I think this is our ninth session of the uh, Eclipse SIG. We're getting close, certainly, to the to the partial eclipse, the annular eclipse uh, in, in mid-October. And uh, it's a countdown to April. Um, not that many sessions between now and then to get things ready. Um, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen with the... Uh, with the agenda. Yeah, so the main topic tonight on the agenda is gonna be um, software, but we have a, a couple of things to talk about before then. I gotta figure out how to advance. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not directly involved, but uh, I did wanna let everybody know that uh, the first batch of Eclipse classes has been received by um, Paul Severance, and he's gonna come up with a scenario for distributing those a plan um, they should be available at the meeting on the 10th the next uh, regular novak meeting and um, they'd also be available at stargaze and other other club events between now and october 14th so um, uh, people who have friends or other opportunities to uh, distribute some Eclipse classes, not only for you, but also the purpose is to get them out into the community to uh, to people who might not otherwise have access. That should be that should be working out pretty soon. Uh, expect some announcements from Severance or uh, or Tommy Domingue on that. Um, uh, Want to specifically thank Dan and uh, uh, Woody who worked the uh, the end at uh, Mitre to to get that going um on uh, the the partial eclipse itself uh, the, which will be partial here uh there are a couple of opportunities for people with an inclination and um, white light or narrow band equipment that would help observe the uh 30 percent partial eclipse as it's viewed from here there will be an event at uh turner farm park Observatory Park uh, that starts uh, 1130 or 1145, something like that. The eclipse itself starts at noon on October 14th. It's a Saturday. And uh, uh, Turner Farm Park is going to be open. The roll-off roof will be open. Uh, we got a confirmation that uh, George Mason will be having an event for, for the eclipse, a public event. It's also there. I think they call it family weekend, but there are a lot of students and families uh, around that weekend. Uh, and they're probably going to do the observing from the roof of the parking deck, the way they did the Mercury Transit a few years ago. Uh, and that would be another place where you could bring your telescope. Uh, we're, we're also in discussion. There may be a public event at Sweet Run State Park. That hasn't been settled yet. We're going to find out about that this week. And uh, word on those will come out probably from candy as uh, as far as outreach activities. There's also a possibility of stargaze, which is scheduled for October 7th, uh, if it's canceled or delayed because of clouds. The rain date for that, the cloud date for that is also on the 14th, but stargaze itself would still be in the evening. It wouldn't be an all day event. So that wouldn't conflict with the uh, Turner Farm Park uh, and GMU events. The um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the, the scripting software as, a, as the major discussion topic. And then we'll, we've got a couple of other discussion items later on for people to contribute things they've found since the last meeting. Uh, and we'll also talk about scheduling another hands-on session and what the schedule would be in content for future meetings. So if I go to the next slide. Okay, so... I'm going to go in. I, I ask people to contribute their experiences about uh, using scripting software. In the past, John Kasianovitz and um, Jeff Ball had mentioned some experiences they had, and I'll sort of fold those in. Uh, Dan mentioned both he and um, Richard Crowell had found the um, Solar Snap. Uh, 
application software and, and uh, filter for iPhones and uh, Androids. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Dan, did you get a chance to try that out with the Sun? Yeah, I, I did a quick test of it just in the front yard. It, it seemed to work fairly easily. Okay, I'll I'll get back to that later on. I just wanted to, to check on that. So if I go to the next slide, we'll get into it. Um, what I found in in looking at the various pieces of software, um, each one has fairly strict limitations on the way it works. Uh, all of these pieces of software seem to be pretty much uh, amateur creations based on trying to do something well, uh, probably initially for the setup that the writer had himself, and um, and then making it a little bit more general purpose and uh, uh, expanding the, the potential user base but still it's an occasional it's an occasional item and the user base is not very large so you have to consider what kind of a camera you have uh, whether you're controlling multiple cameras what kind of a computer operating system you have for um, hosting it and in this uh, I didn't mean to say iOS I meant to say Mac OS um, and whether it's an integrated device such as iOS, Android, um, the C Star product, uh, the new C Star, Unistellar products, and stuff like that, um, each one of those has its own peculiarities about the kind of software which might be available when you go looking for what might fit what you want to do. There are also various levels of integration which you can expect to do, going all the way from just something very basic, which would be a remote release and an interferometer. Uh, primarily so you can either take a time series, for example, during the partial phases to make a time lapse, or at least just not jiggle the camera when you're taking pictures, um, which is a pervasive problem in eclipse photography because at some point you're going to be taken off the filter and putting on a filter, and you're always at risk of jiggling it. And uh, very few people have automated the filter removal process, although... Of course, everything's possible. Um, you might use a generic program like Nina or Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon um, that's not specifically designed for eclipses, uh, but could be manually scripted. And, uh, and then you get to the full up eclipse unique scripting. The basic difference that I found between the generic scripting software and the eclipse unique scripting is that Eclipse Unique allows you or it will automatically figure out the contact times and reference your exposure scripts to those contact times. Uh, and the best of them, you put in your latitude and longitude, it has the ephemeris, the Eclipse ephemeris built in, and it will calculate, particularly when second and third contacts are, and it will run the scripts synchronized with second and third contracts. So you don't have to do anything except take off the filter and in some cases change the F ratio if that's important. So going on, um, what I found was that the common denominator in the software was that more of it worked with Canon than, uh, than anything else. Some worked with Nikon. And of course, Canon and Nikon seem to be the most pervasive DSLRs in the astronomy community. Um, for other cameras, only the most basic controls, uh, in particular shutter clicks, uh, can be automated. The, um, the only software I found was written for Windows and Mac, uh, as also might be expected from uh, from something that came out of the amateur user community itself. Uh, it's it's not a commercial product. I don't think anybody's written for Linux. Uh, and most of these products are uh, works of love and they're either free or cheap uh, because people develop them just to support the community. Uh, in, in one particular case, someone who had attempted to have a commercial pro version of the software 
apparently did not get enough support for that product and just gives it away. Not the pro version. Uh, he doesn't want to deal with people. One one problem with, of course, freeware is you don't get any support. And I think these people who have written the software uh, don't want to answer the phone a lot. They just they just want to do their own eclipse chasing. So these are the specific products that um, we've identified. There are a few others. Uh, Set and C, which stands for something. It's a European product. Eclipse Orchestrator, Solar Eclipse Maestro, Solar Snap, uh, which is the new product this year for the iPhone and Android, and then some others. And then we've got the non-specialized ones, as I mentioned. Set and C. Um, uh, this is one that I've downloaded because it runs on Windows and uh, and works with Canon, which is my configuration. Um, so I, I set this up. I tried it basically not, not in Eclipse simulation, but just looking at what it would do. And it seems very nice. It seems to do everything you might hope for as someone who is not looking to spend a huge amount of time setting up to get a script for the eclipse. Uh, in particular, once you give it the latitude and longitude that you'll be working at, it comes up with a default script of everything you might want to take. So it has built into it Fred Espinac's uh, recommended exposure times. And um, of course, that's fairly straightforward once you specify the neutral density filter you're going to be using. And it has a catalog of those. So um, you, you put in your neutral density, your F ratio, and it calculates um, recommended and your camera type, specifically the, the Canon model. And it calculates a recommended series of ISO values and exposure times, and then allows you to edit that proposed setup. And during totality, it runs through a range of um, inner, uh, inner, inner corona to outer corona exposure times. Uh, it gives you, I believe, if I recall correctly, it gives you some hints on the maximum exposure time you might tolerate based on the focal length that you're using and uh, and F ratio you're using. So it's filled with with helps of um, to set this up. And you can edit things. If you don't like what it's adopted as as um, basics, you can uh, you can edit this. Has anybody in the group used this? Did anyone use this in 2017? Yeah, I did. This Charlie, I did. Yeah. Um, you have some comments on how it worked? Uh, it worked great. Uh, my first eclipse, first photographing the eclipse, and I got some great images. I, I, di I did practice a few times uh, just taking sun pictures and uh, trying to ex uh, exposures with full sun to make sure it matched. And, but, uh, and it also what it, it also gave me a beep when I had to remove the filter and put it back on. So it, it it lets you know when you want to put your filter back on to to, to keep from burning your camera out. Uh, so yeah. it, it was a good one. And uh, if you're using a Canon, I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, it's um, after looking at all of these, it's it's certainly what I plan to use. Um, yeah, and I noticed it has the the uh, audio prompts. I'm not sure if this one allows you to save a wave file that allows you to scream at yourself or whatever, you know, plan it in advance. But I don't yet, know. I haven't, I haven't downloaded the latest version. I, I planned on doing that this weekend. Uh, it's version uh, seven, eight, 10, uh, I'm, excuse me, uh, version 417.1.0. Uh, and I think that uh, he says, don't use exposure tables from earlier versions. So uh okay does, does this support the newer canon r versions and the ra i don't know i have i haven't downloaded it yet so i can't i can't answer that 
Oh, okay, for the new version. How about the old version? I mean, the RA has been around for a few years. Well, it it uh, just the example there has an EOS 5D Mark II. So that's, that's not yeah, an old I have an older Canon um, that was current in 2017 when the when yeah. uh, the last previous version came out. So I didn't have any incompatibilities. Um, when when you go to the RA, is is that astronomy modded? Yes. Um, I don't recall Factor. having run into any discussions about adjustments to exposures if you have a modded camera. That's an interesting question. Actually, I, mine was modded, and it's an it's an old T three which I used in twenty seventeen, uh, and uh, it was there was no issue just because it was modded. It was uh, I think I just had to do a white balance. That's basically all I did, and keep the exposures down because the mod is just flat. Uh, and and, and I just, anyway, I'd suspect since you're doing so much uh, bracketing in effect during the totality that it would be an, a non-issue but um and and certainly the the modding would increase the saturation of the prominences which are hydrogen so uh the, their hydrogen emission as opposed to the corona itself which is mainly scattered light so that's the corona is white light but the prominences should look better with a modded camera uh, which is interesting and not significantly affect the exposure. But it's good to know you didn't have a problem with it, Charlie. No, I didn't. Uh, I, and I basically, like I say, I tried uh, getting exposures and stuff based on the white filter. And then when in totality, I knew I'd have, I used his recommended exposures. I think I didn't try to second guess it. I think the yeah. only thing I may have done was... Uh, uh, limited. I I have a tele telephoto lens at two point eight. I I think I used it at f four. That was that was the only thing because uh, that that particular lens that two hundred millimeter uh, it's sharper at the edges with f four. Yeah, and I and I'd think off the top of my head the one thing you do because the prominences would come through is you might try a shorter exposure, a, a sort of a one-stop shorter exposure during totality than it would recommend to start at to uh, uh, to capture I, the problem. Well, I don't think I did. I think I followed the, the prescription pretty closely because I'd never done it before. <laughs> so, yeah, so. No, that's, yeah, rather than walk around. That's good, good to know. Okay, um, let me move on to the... Next one, um, Eclipse Orchestrator, I also downloaded. Um, it works with Windows and, and Nikon and Canon intrinsically. Um, that's the one that he used to have a pro version for about $110 and, and stopped offering that uh, with no indication that he would start again. And uh, it's just my personal opinion. He probably got um it probably wasn't worth his while to deal with the people who expected hand holding uh once they paid him 110 dollars and they wanted it all uh you know the week before the eclipse or something and i i i just downloaded that this evening and i haven't i don't have any experience with it so i i'm not trying to speak to that but when i went through the steps and i said hey i'm interested in the pro and then it takes you to the pro page and it says but before you buy this, you ought to check out the free version first. But it looks like it gives you the option to buy the pro version still. Um, the the website said no, and I I hadn't checked the website for about two weeks, so he might have changed his mind. Um, there were a couple of features that I noticed quickly in the pro version. It had um, more options for customizing the exposure times for Bailey's beads and diamond ring and maybe prominences. Uh, and it also supported multiple cameras simultaneously. Right. And um, if, if that's important, the, the thing that uh, made me relatively less interested in Eclipse Orchestrator than 
uh, sentence C, uh, first of all, because I have the option with the canon. But the second thing was that uh, the, the means of creating the script seemed cruder than the, the features in sentence C. Uh, certainly, it allowed you complete flexibility, but it looked like it might take more effort to configure it. And, uh, and and less was being done for you by default. And I only looked at it very briefly because uh, I was trying to get through a lot of stuff. Um, it offers, and, and I didn't get to this, one of the things that seems advantageous is it allows you to have a, uh, a graphical display of the script you've created. So it gives you a, uh, a, a, a music scroll kind of display of um, of what you've asked for to make sure that you're not generating any internal conflicts, I guess, especially if you have multiple cameras. Um, he he um, emphasizes the delay associated with the time between exposures if you have to do downloading. And one of the features in, in Eclipse Orchestrator is it will both activate a shutter release and separately communicate with USB. Now, my camera doesn't have a separate shutter release from the USB, so I can't take advantage of it. But as he points out, if you have both of those on your camera, then the USB can be taking advantage of the buffering of the image inside the camera and doesn't have to wait for download before taking the next image. So if you want to take the images in very fast succession during totality and not wait two or three seconds, then um, hook it up both with uh, the shutter release and the USB. Now, my Canon, I, I don't know of any cameras that have that. I don't know which models have that capability, but um, it, it's a, an extra feature. The um, so yeah so the standard standard version of Eclipse Orchestrator is also free, and one of the things I found most enlightening was uh, his lessons learned. Ten top causes of non-success, and you can read these too. But I think they're I think they're insightful. Um, and the first one relates to that synchronization. If you if you don't uh, test out how long it takes your camera to download, then you can end up locking up the whole system. And related to that, um, I guess this is number three, which is don't do your practices with the lens cap on because the download time may depend on how many photons you've captured and how much information there is in the image in the camera. Now, this is this was written some number of years ago. It may not matter as much now, but um, uh, the, the, what the army says, train the way you fight, um, do all your testing as close to real, real, uh, situation as you can, as you can possibly do. Um, does it come with a, to... uh, an eclipse simulator? What's that? Does it, does it come with an eclipse simulator? This one, I don't believe does. Um, but I didn't get into it far enough. I think one of the things we'll get to um, um, Maestro, the, the one for the, for the Mac, does have a simulator. Uh, uh, I use this one for the 217 Eclipse. Mm -hmm. And it does, it calculates the times of all the four contacts very precisely as long as you give it a precise, you know, your location. And you can, uh, you know, so it, you can tell it to do things like take these pictures uh, relative to particular contacts, you know, so like first contact or third contact, whatever. Yeah, I and think what, what, I, I think what um, was it, John, who was speaking? Um, yes, I was wondering, I, I can imagine doing something like just uh, running a video of an eclipse or something like that. Uh, in front of the camera, just to get the timing right or whatever is necessary. I, yeah. I think I think that 
I think that um, the one that's on the Mac does simulate it, but I, I don't have a Mac, so I didn't test it out. I just saw the words. So uh, I'm not sure if it's just that it shows you in real time what the eclipse would look like at your site or actually generates synthetic camera data, um, which is, I think, what you're getting at, John. Yeah, it doesn't do that. You can set it, you know, pretend it's this time. And so you can say, pretend it's 2024, right before the eclipse and watch what your camera does. But it doesn't yeah. generate data that goes into your camera. Yeah, this, that's what that's what this one does. Oh, uh, It's important yeah, I... to know that maybe that this one, you don't hook it, you hook it up to your computer, but the images stay on the camera. When it says download, they mean download to the the what do you call it? The the chip on the that you're recording data to in the camera, not to your computer. Like a thumb drive? W whatever your whatever it's on storage your camera. drive storage the card, chip. the data card. Yeah, the card on your data card on your camera. It doesn't down I mean, instead of the processing memory. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't go the data never goes to your computer. Well, it, it did on mine because I didn't have a chip on my uh I didn't have a storage media in the camera itself so did you it, use a usb connector to to yeah, use your computer I, yes i did yeah it usb connected to the computer were you talking about set and see yeah yeah okay well eclipse orchestrator doesn't do that i think you actually can on a canon at least see the pictures but it's all you know the, the fastest way to do it is just to only store to the card not transfer to the computer. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I agree. That's the fastest way. It's just that I didn't do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's. I did I mean, use that's... Eclipse Orchestrator in 2017, and uh, I actually I used it on one camera, and uh, but the other camera I just used an intervalometer, which I you know programmed in advance, and the uh, Eclipse Orchestrator it did okay. I did run a couple of simulations, if you want to call that, in advance. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I wasn't thrilled with it. I probably I, I don't plan to use it this time. It worked okay, adequate. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that highlights one of the issues, which is that the for free the the builders of this software can't go through all the possible permutations of the way you've set the camera and the way you've set the software to operate and the interoperability. So it's really a case of your your mileage may vary, that uh, you have to check it with your setup and, and see if you've done it possibly the best way. And it may also be that the way it interacts with different cameras is different because either what features the camera has, the camera manufacturer has offered to the third party vendors or because they're just intrinsically different in the way they operate. Um, as Gene's pointing out, yeah, some cameras may only go to the memory card. Some may give you a choice um, and the choice may depend on what's in the computer or may depend on what's in the camera. Um, I mean, there's cameras with Wi-Fi, So, you know, you could, if you're not taking pictures too quickly, uh, then you might be able to take them right to the web or something. Well, do you, I'm not clear that all of the software will work with Wi-Fi, or it may depend on some of the drivers that you have loaded in your computer, whether it works with Wi-Fi. Um, in everything I've run into, they default to USB. But, uh, well, I shouldn't say about the Mac. I don't know what the Mac defaults to. But um, I would think that would depend on the camera is what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, with it, the Wi-Fi. I mean, certainly the camera has to have the capability, but then the software has to be willing to talk to the camera with Wi-Fi. If the software doesn't connect with that driver, it's only going to try to talk on USB. And, um, you know, I guess I, that takes us to step two. Yeah. I mean, you've got to try it and uh, it can take a lot of experimentation. Okay. Let me let me move on. So as I said, Eclipse Maestro is um, Mac OS. 
It, uh, it claims to work with a lot of cameras. Uh, it's not clear to me what level of interaction it has. Um, Javier Jubier is um, uh, a very prolific software, Eclipse software guy. And I've got to believe that what he's done is done well. But uh, as I said, I did test it out. And the, the, um, the screenshots there are not really screenshots that I took, but they're screenshots from the website that give an idea of the kind of illustrations. Basically, he's taken his, um, his Eclipse prediction software and incorporated it in, uh, you can't see my pointer. Neither can I. What do I got here? There's a pointer. So he's taken his Eclipse simulation software, which is already very extensive, and it shows the the path of the uh, shadow on the ground in various ways. And he's added the the scripting software. And I don't know how much help it provides. I, I presume it's it's pretty good. And here the I see, I see a red dot moving around on the screen. Is that your mouse? That's my that's my mouse, my pointer, which I'm attempting to illustrate what I'm saying. But uh, and it's don't it there. turkey. <laughs> there seems to be some kind of latency. <laughs> yeah, you got a bit of latency in that pointer. Okay, sorry about that. Work on my bandwidth. Okay. Um, any did anybody in the group use that at the previous eclipse? It's been around for a while. Eclipse Maestro. Okay, I think um, I think it may be what John Kasianovitz used, um, and he talked about, and he was if if it is he was highly uh, uh, positive on it for, and and I believe and he was controlling multiple cameras. Okay. Next up, Solar Snap, which is this new product that's come out from uh, uh, come out for iOS and Android to to be used on smartphones for the Eclipse. Um, I didn't get the kit, but I downloaded the software. I've got an iPhone Seven Plus. Is that it's an old one? Um, and tried it out, and I didn't have a lot of success. Um, I could not get the exposure time to be short enough to not overexpose the sun. Um, even even trying again this morning when it cleared up. Um, but I had tried it a few days ago also. In in my experience, the, the least exposure it would do down here at the bottom was ISO 20 F28, which is intrinsic to the camera. And we'll only go down to 120th of a second. Um, and and that's not short enough with a uh, with an ND five filter to get the partial phase. Now, Dan, you said it seemed to work okay when you tried it. I uh, I had I was very unpleased with the image on the smartphone. Honestly, uh, it did take images like you said. It didn't have the range I thought it would need for especially a, a total. So I I tried it. And I didn't spend a lot of time with it, maybe 10, 10 minutes or so, one after, afternoon. And I thought, you know, I got better stuff. So I just kind of moved on. I, I didn't give it a fair trial, but, yeah. Well, I, I, I tried. Uh, what's that, John? Could you use a, a heavier filter, a denser filter, or double up? Well, you'd never double up. You, you wouldn't want the uh, the reflections. Um, the, the other problem I have, at least with the concept, which is that the, um, the filter is attached with Velcro to, to the back of your, of your phone, um, with an ND5 filter, you've got to be very careful to prevent ambient light from coming in the backside and scattering into the lens. And unless it's really sealed to the case, which I doubt you can do with a Velcro dot, I think you're going to have problems with scatter. 
uh, even even during partial. Uh, I've got a couple more about it, a couple more slides. Uh, what what I try to let me skip this. This is too hard to explain, but uh, I, I downloaded um, a sibling of the software. It mentioned it mentioned in the literature that. The, even though the product comes from American Paper Optics, which is a company that makes uh, solar glasses. Uh, the software was written by a company called Rise Up Games. And I looked them up because I suspected it might be a um, modified version of something else they did. And it is. Uh, that company has a product called ProShot, which is, a, which is an iPhone Android app for $7, which I downloaded. I've been downloading a lot of stuff, um, which is just a general purpose control the camera program. And that did quite well um, as far as getting the dynamic range. And let me show you what I, what I did with that. So here was some test yesterday when it was cloudy. Um, I just shot directly into a spotlight an led spotlight so in the middle of this picture over here you've got the led in the middle of a, of a little lens attachment that's part of a down down spot and i put a um, basically a thick paper clip across it to give me something to focus on so this is um this is a direct view from the iPhone into the spotlight. And as you can see, it um, the exposure value is minus 17, EV is minus 17.1. Um, but it's uh, basically a nine thousandths of a second, which is as short as the iPhone will go. And ISO 20, and it's still a little bit overexposed. Now this is with no filter. And then I went in and basically increase the exposure by about a factor of a million, um, which is impressive that you can do with an iPhone, using the uh, Pro Shot. So I went from a nine thousandth of a second to 60 seconds. And um, for some reason, it reported it as being F14. I don't fully understand that, not F18, at ISO 50. And I got a decent exposure, and, and the, the film was dirty. so. Don't don't go by the focus quality, and the coloration is really what the the filter does. So the the iPhone itself does have a dynamic range of on the order of a million to one if you really want it. Um, and then today when it cleared up, I compared the snap the solar snap with the Pro Shot. And this was the minimum exposure I could get with the solar snap, which was reported as ITHO 32, F28, 160th of a second, which corresponds to an exposure value of 10.5. And then on the pro shot, I was able to get a shorter exposure. Um, this is not necessarily optimal, but clearly the sun here is not saturated. And um, and that was at a much shorter exposure time, uh, one five thousandth of a second. So it's basically uh, one one hundredth of well, and three times that. So one thirtieth of the minimum exposure that the the uh, solar snap could do, and that seems reasonable. And and I don't know why solar snap doesn't allow me to do that especially since it comes from the same software guys, but it doesn't. Now it is possible that the kit filter on solar snap is denser than my ND5, but I I don't really think so. And and by the way, they both seem to have gotten um an effective focal length full frame of 850. Um which is sort of phony baloney because the uh, the magnification is just digital. It's not it's not really zoom, but it does allow you to capture. And this is a JPEG. I began um, 
Pro Shop allows you to capture raw, and I only began to play with that and didn't make much progress. So anyway, I think um, there may be others out there, but I think for seven bucks, if you want to do something with your iPhone or your Android, that might be the way to do it. Now, the caveat in just spending a few hours with it, it is really difficult to focus and point an iPhone screen at the sun. You've got to use a tripod, um, especially if you use ma a magnification. And if you're in full sunlight, the light reflecting off you and your face and your clothes is going to pretty much wipe out the screen. Plus, the screen is facing down when the, when the camera is facing at the sun. And it's going to be very difficult to deal with. And uh, the pictures that show happy children pointing their iPhone at the sun and taking pictures is a lot of baloney. Plus, um, your camera, if you leave it out in the sun, is going to get really hot on the tripod. And this is a problem. Dan pointed out the idea of getting a, uh, a, so, uh, a reflector and punching out a hole to make it a sunshade to go over your camera and just let the lens poke out, which I've also just a tried. sheet of white paper, I think, would help. A anything that creates a shade. Um, Dan pointed out that the, um, uh, elas uh, the elastic uh, sunshades, uh, sun reflectors that people use for fill light um, are very effective. And I, I bought a couple of those on on uh, eBay or Am Amazon or something. Cut a hole in the middle. The fabric is sort of stretchy. It will hold, it will grab on the front of the lens. But I don't see any way to do that with a, um, and I don't see an easy way to do that with an iPhone on a, on a tripod. Uh, so the, there are a lot of practical problems with it. Uh, Double-sided uh, tape? What's that? Double-sided tape just to attach it to the back side of your camera? Yeah, but you still got the problem. You want to get to the filter and get it on, get it off. Maybe, you know, with some creativity or Velcro. Uh, now, the other thing I'll say when I took the sample pictures with um, with my filter is I taped the ND5 filter film tightly all around the lens. So I didn't have to deal with uh, scattered light sneaking in from the side. But I, I think that's a real problem. So anyway, I think I think it's possible to do it. I'd also like to uh, experiment with the Dwarf 2 and see what it will do. Now, certainly, it has a much longer physical focal length than the iPhone camera. So the intrinsic magnification, the intrinsic plate scale is going to be better. And uh, it might be easier to focus. I don't know. I haven't had time with that. I uh, haven't heard of anybody who's produced custom software for the Dwarf 2 or for any of the uh, integrated automated telescopes that would allow them to be used for the eclipse. I imagine someone will be clever and do that. I, I, don't, uh, I don't know when that would be forthcoming when we would find out about it, but it's probably something to be on the lookout for. Uh, anybody else have any suggestions about iPhone eclipse photography or related integrated cameras? Nope. I had a question about the Dwarf 2. That has two cameras built into it, doesn't it? Yes. Um, but you know, just like the iPhone has at least two, uh, I guess now they have three. Oh, oh right. Yes, of course. It has two, you know, one narrow and wide. The, the philosophy on the Dwarf 2 is a little bit different that the um, the wide field cameras all of, always available for uses like a finder, and um, you can you can electronically zoom the narrow field of view uh, camera. Uh, th there are a couple of things in that. One is you would always have to have a filter over both, and they're side by side, one and a quarter inch screw in filter holders, which is perfectly doable. Um, I was actually thinking if I have the time and the time to experiment, I'd like to set up the Dwarf 2 to take flash spectrum 
which is to put a grating over the lens. And at that instant before the chromosphere is covered by the moon, okay. you get you get an emission line spectrum of uh, of the solar atmosphere, which would be interesting. And that might be something I could dedicate mm. something like the dwarf to mm. to doing. So uh, as I remember, the dwarf two is like a couple of thousand dollars, isn't it? No, it's uh, four hundred. Oh, you're Thank thinking you. of the Stellina and the EV scope and those guys. Yeah, it's about a factor of ten different. Wow. All right, I'm not. I'm not going to start commenting on the dwarf two. I mean, it's, to some extent, the the uh, the software has been a disappointment. The optics is fine, um, but the software support to date is not up to it. Uh, I hope they'll fix it, but uh, it's it's a little bit uh, beta. So uh, at least conceptually, it's it's software design software designed by software people who think yeah. they know what astronomers need. Uh, it wasn't designed by astronomers. Okay, um, let me move on. How are we doing on time? We're a third of the way through our two hours. <laughs> Not quite. We're better than that. Um, Jeff Ball mentioned Magic Lantern. I'll go over it quickly. Um, this is not for the faint of heart. It turns out that a group of people have figured out how to basically hack a Canon camera to run a script internally from the memory card. Um, because there's a there's a computer built into the uh, the most of the current Canon, and um, they call that product Magic Lantern. It's uh, freeware, and as I said, Jeff Ball, uh, who was hooked up with a with a computer guy, figured out how to do that. So you can you can script the uh, all the functions of a Canon camera to run without a computer, without an external computer, which is which is a neat hack. And it controls all the all the resources of the camera. Uh, it was actually done to to make the Canon camera into a more powerful uh, video camera, but it has powerful still scripting capabilities. And uh, you know, when you see the uh, all these slides will be posted. And uh, if you're interested, you can you can try you can try that. Do you, have you have you used it or do, no, do you know no. if it uh, lets you monitor its progress while it goes ahead and runs its own? Well, software? you still have you still have the live view on the camera, and as a matter of fact, it it enables some functions in live view which are not normally available from from the uh, online menus. It, it basically extends the menu system to to do macros that you've put in. Now it will not. Um, it will not automatically reference the scripts to the aspects of the eclipse. Your camera doesn't know what time second and third contacts are. So you would have to either program it to be initially initialized when you tell it to go from one script to the next, or possibly give it the absolute time. I'm not sure if it has absolute clock in it. Uh, for your location. And of course, uh, in some of these, you got to be very careful. If you intend to be mobile and you have the script set up to a certain latitude and longitude, and you forgot to change the latitude and longitude when you move, uh, you could have your contact two time wrong. And uh, it's not that hard to be off by two minutes. If you move, if you move a lot, the morning of the eclipse. Not to mention yeah. if you're chasing a hole in the clouds. Yeah. Okay. You know, just uh, some kind of a local. I mean, not a local, but an app that helped us predict exactly where we were, all the contact points and timings, and inside the Magic Lantern script were the fields to input those times for your latitude, longitude. You okay. had to do that on the. You had to do that on a laptop. You had to save that to you know the script, write the script to basically this firmware is updated on your compact flash card. And when 
the Canon camera boots up, I believe there was a combination of buttons to hold to tell the camera to boot off of the compact flash card. And then that's what starts the uh, firm, the, the magic lantern override software. I'm not going to be using it this time. I, this kind of has fallen out for newer cameras. You know, I've got a Canon RA and a Canon RP and no one's really updating magic lantern for that. There's a lot of hesitancy to, I'm not sure exactly what has changed on the firmware software side of things, but no one on the Magic Lantern site is going into those cameras with confidence. So I'm looking at an independent, probably a laptop connected interface going into 2024. Okay, that's good to know. Are you going to be on a Mac or a Windows? I'm on a Mac and I've actually got something new. I don't even know. I just pulled this up. This meeting kind of really got me fired up about to looking at it. Have you looked at this Capture Eclipse for a Mac? It's actually an app, but it does a simulation, and I'm going to probably experiment with this. You say it's called Capture Eclipse? Capture Eclipse. It looks like it might be fairly new. And on my MacBook, I can run iOS apps. So that's what, ideally, that I, that's what I would be doing, is running an iOS app on this MacBook. Um, and, it's, yeah, it's called Capture Eclipse. And is it Wi-Fi coupled to the cameras, or how is it coupled? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to find all that out. I just saw it. Yeah, so just bring it, all your cable. Just bring all your cables and hope that one works, right? Yeah. Man, well, <laughs> like I said, it has a simulator, so we will definitely be running this thing through the paces, and maybe by next meeting we'll have some feedback on it. Okay. Well, I'll I'll add a note about that name, and I'll I'll try to delve in a little bit, but. I'm not sure if you heard at the beginning. Um, I don't have access to Mac, and uh, I'm, I'm no longer a Mac person. I started out being one, but business didn't let me. The company didn't let me. So um, I, I can't review any of the Mac products, but I'd appreciate your your insights if you come up with anything. Sounds um, good. Yeah, and I might try to run whatever current orchestrator version is out there as well. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I was going to mention uh, a couple of others. Um, Umbrafile um, does not seem to be updated for Mac, and Eclipsedroid does not seem to be updated. Um, it doesn't look like is well. Eclipsedroid might be useful for Android devices, but there again, I can't, I can't evaluate it. So, um, if anybody checks it out, please send a note, and I'll. I'll add it to our uh, to our forum, or you can send you can send your own observations on uh, on whether Eclipse Droid is useful for for people with Androids. Now, I think Eclipse Droid specifically will control the Android camera itself, um, as well as having the option to control USBs uh, externally. But I don't know which kinds. Uh, I didn't have time to to even look at their literature. Okay, the um, another approach, and, and I won't say a lot about it. Um, I use back, backyard EOS with my Canon and uh, and my telescope, just because I'm just a beginner, and um, that has some nice features. I like the fact that I can watch the uh, the live screen on my computer and put the computer, especially for solar observing i'd be uh, daytime observing i'd be able to put the computer screen inside a box and uh and have a better idea of focus and composure composition uh and pointing so uh, i'm i like the way backyard eos works uh there's also another version backyard nikon which i haven't used uh and i assume that nina and asi air could all be scripted uh based on your own knowledge of um, contact two, contact three times to to control a camera and have a wider variety of cameras probably. Uh, and there again, I think you have control, at least in backyard EOS, uh, when the data is downloaded, uh, whether it stays in the camera or gets downloaded immediately. So 
So from what I saw from a Windows point of view, I like set and see. Um, and from a theoretical point of view, Eclipse Maestro, uh, if you're a Mac person. Um, Orchestrator, if you can't use set and see for, for an icon. Um, for an iPhone and Android, I wouldn't use Solar Snap, but ProShot looks looks promising. Uh, and if nothing else, always use a remote release. Uh, even though we're generally talking about short exposures, vibration is never your friend, uh, and the chance of knocking something is always too high. So you can always buy a twenty dollar remote release for just about any camera, and uh, have that level of confidence. And if nothing else. They, they generally come with intervalometer functions, so you can take your time lapse during um, the partial phases. Of course, you have to point out that if you enlarge the sun to be at all uh, a significant fraction of your field of view during the hour or so, hour and a half or so of the, of the partial phases, it will drift out of the field of view. So if you're going to take a time lapse, you have to be on some sort of a tracking mount. Uh, doing it by hand will be too jerky. So I I, I don't know what the trade-offs there are. Um, I'd say, if nothing else, something like an Aptron uh, tracking mount on a tripod would be a good a good way to go with anything that you're trying to do a time lapse. And as the uh, the ten the ten hints said, and everybody else has said, practice, practice, practice uh, before the eclipse. Anybody else have comments on scripting? I, I appreciate the interaction we've had so far. I use Backyard EOS myself, uh, uh, but not a whole lot anymore. I use Nina now, but uh, it uh, it does have a lot of nice features, especially if you're trying to frame and focus something. Uh, that That helps you out a lot. Yeah, I think um, one of the comments I had on on the difference between the um, the two apps for the uh, for the iPhone, the ability to take off the filter and focus on something in the distance uh, before you look at the sun and lock it was was good in the Image Pro or whatever that one's called. Um, Whereas I wasn't as confident that the solar snap would really lock the focus. And it's tough to try to focus on the disk of the sun. You're not seeing the edge, you're seeing the disk. Now, when you get to a partial phase, it's easier to see the cusps and, and probably get a focus. But by then, it may be too late for what you're trying to capture. So... Um, yeah, there are a lot of issues, and and something that allows you to do live view or preview of uh, of the focus would help. Uh, one of the one of the hints also was that uh, once you get it in focus, use some tape to hold it there if it's too easy to knock it off. Uh, but if it's cooling down rapidly, check your focus if at all possible just before totality, because cooling may have changed the focal of your uh, optical system. I never okay. thought of that. Uh, by the way, you were talking about scripts. Uh, what, uh, what kind of editor do you, did you use for those scripts? Does that require a special editor or just uh, text or something? On, um, on one of them, even though it said the script was a CSV, it said only edit it in the app. Now I don't know about I don't know about some of the others. Is that because they use some kind of meta language or uh, uh, he, HTML he gave or something? The, he gave the reason why, but there was some. I would assume it's too easy to screw up. You know, and there may be some there may be some non-visible character. I don't know what he's what he's done, but um, they all offer. Everyone I saw offers an in-app editor that is functional, not a text editor. So you edit the exposure time, the ISO value, the delays between exposures, anything else which can be controlled 
by timing and direct management of the camera can be edited by mnemonic, not by ASCII stream. Uh, you, you probably don't want to get into ASCII steam, ASCII uh, programming of uh, computer commands. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Uh, but if you, as you say, most of the apps have the editor included, then maybe that's a moot question. Yeah, and I should say I didn't see one. I wouldn't consider one that didn't have it a good amateur product. I think that's possibly a case where the um, where the 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 Canon hack uh, using the uh, booting from the disk, booting from the uh, chip that may get you a little bit more into the binary or the hex. I, d I don't know, but um, yeah, the, the, uh, the higher level scripting programs don't require you to edit a text script and I'm not sure they permit it. Okay, so that, that that's true. not a word. That's all I needed to know. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's more the question of whether or not the scripting app tells you if you're doing something stupid. If you schedule two exposures for absolute times, you know, if I if I schedule one for 10 seconds and another one for after the minute, and the other one for 20 seconds after the minute, and the first one is supposed to be a duration of 15 seconds, will it tell you that you screwed up or you didn't put enough time between them? And I think they will. And especially with the graphical editor, it'll show the collision. That, that I have two exposures that overlap. Now, again, most of the exposure times we use with the solar eclipse are not very long. So it shouldn't be difficult to avoid collisions, but it's always possible, especially if you go in and manually edit as opposed to taking defaults. And that's one of the reasons why I sort of like the uh, set and C, because the defaults are rational. They've been thought through and are... are probably tested to not generate a conflict. Uh, did I understand right that the uh, set and C actually sensed the uh, uh, second and third contact? No, no, it predicts them. It takes it takes your latitude, longitude. And okay, altitude. so that has to be uh, reprogrammed if you decide to move yes. significantly. Yes, uh, within a couple hundred feet. So you could, you, you can... You can read it off, you know, as long as you have connectivity, as long as you have um, connectivity to a computer, you should be able to, uh, or or you have a GPS of some sort. Uh, you can get your latitude, longitude. I don't think uh, at these elevations, your, your altitude is going to, uh, you know, your elevation above sea level is not going to measure, uh, matter too much. We're not, we're not talking about being in the mountains. So, um, yeah, as long as you get the right latitude and longitude, it will calculate C2 and C3 and reference your scripts from that. I wonder if uh, blue, uh, Spruce Knob would be significant. Um, yeah, but observing from Spruce Knob is not a problem this year for the eclipse. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, if, a, it's if, an option. If you want to get the time of the eclipse there, you know, within a couple of weeks is, is good enough because <laughs> it ain't going to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have an update. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had Matt Penn uh, speak to the group about the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. For those who might not have been connected on that, that that's a group they're trying to get about 70 people that are going to have identical uh, 180 millimeter focal length uh, scopes using uh, uh Planet One cameras and such. Uh, uh, they're using SharpCap, and they've written a custom Python script because uh, SharpCap, native out of the box, isn't really that good for Eclipse stuff. But they have this Python script, so they they have if you know if you remember that or want to go back and look at the early broadcast on it, they do have an, a script that they were setting up for that particular project. That's it. Is it Dan? Is it unique to the sequences that they want everyone to capture? Yeah, the, and uh, the, their hope is to have now. There's 
hope is to have 90 people spread across the eclipse path that will be taking identical sequences locally timed for totality uh but the same you know duration uh, sequences uh mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's, a, that's a good way to do it. I mean, it's lock it down, I guess, and uh, yeah, and and have consistency. Okay. Um, did did you get your hardware, by the way? Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So, other topics to talk about before as as we wrap up. Um, like to have a a second practice or suggesting a second practice and um, have it before the um, the annular eclipse some people are going um, or people will be observing the partial eclipse for fun and profit um, I was going to suggest that we do it before the Crockett um, public uh, uh, okay yeah the September Crockett not not the uh, stargaze in October um, but this September 9th is a Novak public night at Crockett. And I was going to suggest that we have a, uh, allow people to run through and, and uh, give it to each other uh, sometime before sunset, which is about 730. Does that make sense to people as an opportunity, another opportunity to, um, to do a setup? Do people want it? Uh, again before um before too too long in the fall or should we just put it off i it's it's probably a low cost to you know a, event to offer to get together if people want at something like five o'clock uh when the sun will be decently above the western horizon so you can take a shot at it uh, I, I think the biggest problem is the lack of food. If we have it too early, then um, people don't have a good way to get dinner unless they stop at the Burger King or McDonald's on the way out 28. And, uh, they still don't have a good way to get dinner. What's that? <laughs> I'd say if they stop it, <laughs> I still, they still don't have a good way to get dinner. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean that that that's a bit inconvenient as opposed to something uh, by itself. Uh, do people have an alternative suggestion? Should I just leave it out there as uh, if people want, then maybe they'll find other people there at five o'clock to uh, to commiserate. Deafening silence or porridge. Um, does does any well does anybody feel a need to do this or can they do it on their own? I guess that's really the question. Yeah, I I kind of do it on my own because you know I don't need a public uh, uh, to watch me practice, which probably will make me mess up anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, of course this wouldn't be with the public that so much, but yeah, I, I get the point. So maybe we should just let it go and and trust that people will do it on their own if they don't have a a need to uh, to do it collectively. I think it was sort of useful last time that uh, people exchanged tips and tricks. Um, but... I'll be out of town, so I'm not going to be around to even consider it. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll just let that go. We don't we don't need to do that. Um, this sort of counts for. Let's see. This sort of counts for. The September meeting, um, and um, the next logical date would be October third. Um, I don't have a topic. I think if we got together in November, some people will have results to report from the annular eclipse. I would hope. Um, I'm. I'm. Uh, Actually, we ended up sort of covering iPhone eclipse photography tonight that hadn't been originally intended. Um, I think maybe we should skip October and plan to get together again in November 
talk about eclipse results and maybe something else will be suggested by the group uh, if if you have any suggestions uh, i would remind people that we have the groups io forum and i've been posting stuff to it uh, i think i put it in most of the invitations how to join it i don't know if it's if people want to share information there i set it up because i i thought this might be too much detail for the overall club uh, listserv. Maybe it's not, but um, I just want to remind people of the group's IO, and we still have materials on the uh, on the uh, Bitly slash TSC twenty twenty four. I expect I'll move that over, even though it's not really file sharing on group's IO. Uh, I can put the same content there. So with that, I, I think we'll we'll schedule it for sort of full moon time, early November, if that doesn't, you know, do it before Thanksgiving time. I, I hate to think about it's getting to be scheduling around Thanksgiving and Christmas already, but that's, that's a reality. Okay. Um, anybody have any other news tips suggestions that uh, they want to contribute dan mentioned his progress on the uh, on the uh, group observing plan the citizen science which is good anybody have anything else that they've discovered i'll mention two little things that i've started one was, I was trying to figure out how to solve, I don't know if I can show things. I was trying to figure out the sol the problem about how to point my DSLR with a te long telephoto at the eclipse. And uh, I realized I had found on Amazon a hot shoe adapter piece of aluminum with a section like this that um, I actually used to mount a, um, a red dot pointer so I could use the, the camera at night. Uh, but by getting just a piece of PVC and putting a piece of aluminum foil at one end with a pinhole in it, literally a pinhole, and a piece of uh, wax paper on the back end. I've got a little, it's, it's a pinhole camera, but I don't see an image of the sun. But when I point this in the direction of the sun, I get a dot on the wax paper. And what I'm going to do is firmly attach it to this hot shoe adapter. And that will give me a pointing aid so that I can get my telephoto lens in the direction of the sun before it's eclipsed. This is quite as a bright sun. And I don't have to be trying to look through the eyepiece of the camera to point at the sun. And, it looks pretty um, ingenious. It looks like you might have to explain that that's not a heat sink. That's not what? A heat sink for your spotting scope? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. It's very similar to what I... Let's see, where's my camera? That's what uh, I... Very similar yeah. to this. Pinhole on this end, white piece of paper in here, fits right into the shoe. Is that a... Is that a... Um, that? that was about $9 on eBay, I think. Oh, okay. That's probably less cost total, especially considering time. Yeah. So that was 3D printed by somebody? Yeah. If you could um, send me or put in the chat what what that was called or how you found it. Uh, yeah, I think it was just a camera shoe solar pointer or something like that. But I'll, uh, okay. I'll have to look it up because it was 2017. 
uh, actually tw probably 2016 when I found it. So <laughs> it's been a long time since I found it. Yeah, the but, one the one thing I noticed, and this partially solves the problem, there is a small set screw on this, so you can fix it with respect to the hot shoe. You can push it on one side and then tighten down the set screw and um, in fact, keep it, it in one alignment. Well, this one just has little uh, nipples at the end that keep it. Uh, you just push it in. It's it's uh, yeah. You you just really need to get it in the ballpark if you have the filter on on yeah. the, on the lens. You can always draw a circle on the wax paper. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Once I get it, yeah, I I um, I do it. If it's once. not aligned, then you put, draw the circle off center. But uh, it's the circle and the dot are then aligned. Yeah, I, and it's just I want to have it repeatable when I re reset the thing. Uh, the other show and tell is I remembered that for a, a technical project many years ago, I had used the Koken system for filters, and the Koken I. It's used by a lot of photographers. It's used for for uh, uh, artistic effects and gradients. But um, I was using it because I needed something that would hold the old Rattan infrared gelatin filters for a technical setup. And um, looks like this. It's a um, there's an adapter. Which has this, which has the screw thread of the front of a lens, and the adapter fits in the slide holder, such that I get a row of slots in front of the lens, and I can get a filter holder. Made I made this out of. Uh, one millimeter plastic that will slide in, slide in, easy for him to say. I haven't put the filters on here yet and be easily removable. Uh, and what I was planning on doing is both putting my uh, ND5 filter material in this filter frame and also have some of the filter frames with uh, diffusing cloth to get uh, flats when when I use the camera. Uh, probably have two layers of two layers of diffusing fabric, which is just uh, white camera diffuser. And uh, this was very successful when I did it many years ago for the technical photography. You can also make opaque lens uh, cover to protect the whole setup. Like that. I never thought about the problem of uh, using a gelatin filter in the sunlight. Say that again. I never thought about the problem of using a gelatin filter in the sunlight. I don't know what the melting temperature of the gelatin is. Oh no, that's that. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the infrared filters I was after. Um, this this is in almost BC when people are using film. Um, but the uh, the Kodak Rattan 89A, 89B infrared filters uh, I needed for some technical photography, and they're only literally available as um, uh, gelatin. And um, I needed to adapt it to a non-standard thread size. So this worked out, the Koken system. Actually, I used a smaller series of the Koken. This is what they call a P-series. Uh, Koken is a French system, but um, and now they're not, now they're Chinese knockoffs. They're not the original French system anymore. But hey, Alan, I found uh, the I found that shoe on uh, online. I sent it to the subscriber groups. Uh, it cost a little bit more than it did in 2016. It's like nineteen dollars now, but it's still worth it. Yeah, yeah. It, it worked well. <laughs> That's good. Okay, well, that's all I have. Alan, Alan, I've got, I've got something. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yes, Robert. Yeah. Hi, it's Robert. Um, hello, everybody. I've been quiet and haven't been attending too many. But since you were talking about the solar targeting system, uh, while I was listening to it, I rummaged through my box to see what I could find that I did for um, 2017. And I, I'm show, going to show it to you here. So show and tell. I just took a piece of wood like this and cut some slots into it. And then I took a piece of, uh, it's the, the stuff that you use to, on a curtain, it's basically the same thing that you guys were talking about. And another with a, with a little pinhole in it. And uh, I did this, I used this on a Stellar View Little Rascal, which I used with this funnel to project and a 16 millimeter lens to project the solar image. And I needed a way to target it. And I came up with this. I, I didn't know about these other targeting systems that you were pointing out, but it seemed pretty, anyway, it's a pretty similar thing. The, the little screw holes there, which I attach with these, I don't know if you can see them there. Um, they're just a neuraled knob with, with screw threads. It just goes into the rings on the on the little rascal uh, directly, and it, it it worked very well. So uh, without buying anything, just a piece of wood and a uh, a saw and a few other things, it's possible to create a small targeting system. I just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, I think I, that's that's a good idea. I think a lot of people go to the workshop or the workbench and see what they have laying around and uh, mm. and, and come up with a solution. But and luckily, the sun during the partial phases is, is plenty plenty bright. Uh, it's yeah, not like yeah. starting at night where everything is dim, except maybe yeah. the moon. So um, yeah, there are a lot of solutions. That's a good one. Um, uh, of course, the the a common solution is just to minimize the shadow. If you have anything cylindrical, like a telescope tube or a, or a telephoto lens. As long as you minimize the shadow, you've gotten pretty close to the solution. Uh, yeah, the only problem is that I never could get that really that good. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the shadow down and moving your hands up, it, it just, I never could do that. <laughs> well, that's, that gets back to practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Well, I got to go see my setup. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think th that's all I have. And, you know, I open it up one more time if anybody has any final comments. Um, I appreciate everybody coming on. And um, uh, this is being recorded as as usual. So we'll post it for those who who missed. And uh, I think I think they missed a good session. Uh, I hope people thought it was worthwhile. And um, we won't see you in uh, the beginning of October, but we will try to do it at the beginning of November and, and catch up on, on how people have progressed. So again, thanks everybody and uh, uh, clear skies out there and going to be some good observing nights for the next few nights. It uh, yeah. just stays out of the way. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you, Thank you Alan. Yeah, wonderful thanks, presentation Alan. too.